You ever wonder why the Russians sold Alaska to the United States? Bigfoot, I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Line. We've done a considerable number of videos about Bigfoot recently, or Sasquatch, or the variation of big-feeted creatures that supposedly roam the United States and Canada. But in this case, we're going to be talking about the time that an entire town was abandoned because of Bigfoot. And that town is, of course, the very, very famous Portlock, Alaska. However, as much as we've been talking about Bigfoot recently, I feel it's important to mention that while I no longer need representation, my injuries have left it difficult for me to sit down for extended periods of time. And that is why I need my standing desk from FlexiSpot. For me, the FlexiSpot Pro Plus Standing Desk E7 has been a godsend. It is so simple to raise and lower the height so that I can stand up and give my poor Sasquatch-inflicted injuries a rest. And to be able to move your desk up and down with the simple push of a button rather than some sort of extraordinary mechanical feat of strength is pretty nice. If you're like me and you like to use a monitor made out of pure lead, then you're in luck because the FlexiSpot E7 actually can hold up to 355 pounds of equipment. On top of all of that, if you're in your mid-twenties like I am, then you know that stability is something that is very much lacking in our day-to-day -day lives. I can actually vouch for it, the FlexiSpot desk is extremely stable. It does not move, and I have the feeling that it would take me getting launched across the room by Sasquatch to actually shake the thing. Honestly, the E7 has been such a game changer for me. I am so much more productive when I'm comfortable, and that has been the first desk I've ever used that has really felt comfortable to me. And they give you peace of mind with a 30-day risk-free return policy, as well as a 15-year warranty. If you trust my opinion, I can confidently tell you that this is the best standing desk that I've ever owned. The E7 is also a perfect alternative to Herman Miller. When it comes to quality and affordability, just go straight for the FlexiSpot E7. It is something you can count on. And if you want to give them a try, you can check it out at the link in the description. But the people who can't give it a try are those from Portlock, Alaska, who vanished mysteriously overnight, essentially, in 1949. But what could cause an entire village of people, all 31 of them, to just up and leave. To understand that, you've got to look into the actual history of the village. Known both as Portlock and Port Chatham, the town itself was established sometime during the early 20th century, although the exact date is unknown. What is known is that Portlock was almost certainly named for the British sea captain Nathaniel Portlock. Nathaniel was a captain on the third Pacific voyage of the more famous Captain James Cook, and left that expedition to form King James Sound Company. The aim of this company was to establish a stronger fur trade in North America, primarily in Canada as well as the as-of-yet-wild lands of Alaska. In 1787, Nathaniel visited what would become Portlock Bay when it was named after him two years later. And though we have stories about Portlock from 1905, the first official documentation that it existed as a known village comes from 1921. Because 1921 is the year that Portlock became established, permanent, and populated enough for a U.S. post office. By the time that the post office was established, the population was mostly russo aleuts who were mixed-race descendants of the original Russian colonists of the area and the local native populations. If this is the first time you've heard of Russian colonization of Alaska, then I'll give you a bit of history there as well. The Russians began exploring the option of colonizing the North American continent during the 1720s under Tsar Peter the Great. But Tsar Peter wasn't just trying to get into the colonialism business, he was trying to modernize Russia. He had spent a considerable amount of time in France and Germany in the West, touring around, looking at what the other European powers were up to, and realizing that Russia's near-feudal system of the 1700s simply wasn't cutting it anymore. Russia was in a bit of a bind, however, because due to their geographic location, as well as the colonial efforts of France, England, Spain, and Portugal, there wasn't a ton left within range for them to take. So, in 1741, by the time they could actually manage to get an expedition together, Vitus Bering, a Danish explorer working in the service of the Russian Empire, was sent east across the Bering Strait, now named for him, to see what was up in that funky little land of the east. Interestingly enough, Bering never actually set foot on Alaskan soil. He ended up getting shipwrecked off the coast and dying on an island which is now, of course, named for him as well. His crew, however, managed to build enough rafts or boats to get themselves back to Russia proper, and the sea otter pelts that they delivered were of such high quality that it convinced the Russians, yeah, Alaska seems like a good place to go. 
Colonies were formally established in Alaska starting in the 1780s, with the first one being in 1784 under a man named Grigory Shelikov. And though the Russians would have a population of about 4,000 within what was known as Russian Alaska, the territory actually controlled by the Russian Empire, only 500 or so at any given time were ethnic Russians. The rest were typically Aleuts, Clinket, or other native tribes. But by the time the Americans purchased Alaska in 1867, the population within Russian Alaska was pretty thoroughly mixed between ethnic Russians and Aleuts. They had lived together, married, and had kids, so this was kind of a mixed population at this point. That mixed bag of Russo-Aleuts would end up forming the primary population of Portlock in 1921. Unfortunately, very little is actually known about the town of Portlock, Alaska because it was so small and it only existed for about half a century as far as we know. For example, despite having a post office since 1921, the village of Portlock only appeared on the U.S. Census in 1940. Although perhaps that's not entirely accurate, it also appeared in 1980 well after being abandoned still with 31 residents, so there's a strange blip in U.S. Census records where 40 years apart, a village that during that 40 years was totally abandoned has the same number of people on the census. I assume it was just a document mix-up. But of course, none of that's the mystery. That's just what Portlock is, where it was, and who lived there. So what happened to them? The earliest mention that I could track down regarding Portlock's misfortunes comes from the Anchorage Daily News, the April 15th, 1973 issue. Author Robert J. Dolitzall, who's known for writing a number of other books and is not really a superstitious guy or any kind of conspiracy theorist, he's mostly been a travel and outdoors author. Anyway, Robert and his friend Janelle were off on a sailing expedition up in Alaska along the coastline for about a month, and as they were returning, they stopped by Portlock to get out of the weather. Interestingly enough, they were on their way to Seward, Alaska, which is a town we've covered in another video about the disappearance of Paul LeMay. Anyway, on the journey back from Kodiak Island, they needed to refuel for their backup motor, basically in case there were no winds to sail on, they could turn on an actual engine and have themselves going in no time, and it was just nice to get out of the weather and check around. And on their outdated maps that they admit were outdated, they saw a little town, a little blip on the map, Portlock, Alaska. Of course, when they arrived, it being 1973, a full 34 years after most people vacated the town, it was pretty obvious nobody lived here. This was a ghost town, there was nothing there, but they still felt curiosity. I mean, there's a whole abandoned town here, we should probably go check it out, right? Initially, they ate dinner on their boat, took a little bit of a nap, and then around twilight went out. You gotta remember, this is Alaska. It is, it is very light for a very long time. By 1973, the word that Dolitzall was using to describe this town was not necessarily spooky or eerie, it was empty. He writes, even the linoleum had been pulled from the floors, and so little remained that the village itself was of little interest. However, the author goes on to note that despite the fact that he and his companion Janelle were really resistant to the idea of the supernatural and any sort of superstition in general, they did both feel an eerie sense that they were being watched, that they weren't alone, that they weren't safe, and instead of sticking around, they decided to go back to the boat. The next day, they reached a little town called Nanwellock, also known as English Bay, where they stayed with a school teacher and his wife. In exchanging stories about their lives in Nanwellock, as well as the travels of Robert Dolitzall, Portlock came up. They probably mentioned that they had passed through and checked out the town and were curious about its story. And what they got was quite the tale. According to the couple, in the 1940s, rumors started to creep their way up the Kenai Peninsula, where Portlock sits, that there was something off about that village. It was a simple cannery town, small population, mostly people from the area, but something was not right there. And Dolitzal's account was not the only one I was able to find. He does go into some detail, but I found some more detailed versions of what I believe to be the same stories, and I'll present those to you in this video. In 2009, a woman by the name of Melania Kell recounted the entire story of Portlock as she remembered it as a child to a local reporter. Speaking through a translator in her native Sugstan language, she told a harrowing tale about the awful things that had happened to people in Portlock before it was abandoned. Dolitzall tells us of rumors about hunters who never returned, giant footprints left in the snow, and dismembered bodies showing up in the lagoon. We get more detail from these other sources. Melania tells us about her godfather, Andrew Kamluk, who was struck in the head by log-moving equipment that no one man could have lifted on his own, 
and died immediately. Nobody had seen it happen, nobody was around to have done it to him, and he can't have done it himself. Another source, a Simeon Kvasnikov, told of a gold miner in the region who had gone off to his mines one day and never returned. Of course, he's a miner, he's underground, maybe there was a cave-in, but it seems like people went looking for him and couldn't find the guy, so it seemed as though he had disappeared somewhere on his way to the mine. And then there's another story from a paramedic who only names himself as Ed to remain anonymous, possibly because he's telling a story about Bigfoot on the internet and people are going to make fun of him for that. But in Ed's story, which he claims occurred in 1990, he was transporting an older native man, about 70 years old, to a local hospital when they got into a conversation about hunting and tracking and fishing and just sharing experiences. Somewhere in the conversation, the EMT mentioned Dogfish Bay, which is just about five miles northwest of Portlock. At that moment, the native man shot up, grabbed him by the shirt, pulled him close, and said, did it bother you? Ed responded that it had, but he himself had not seen it. He asked if the native man had seen it, and he was told, no, but my brother did. Well, the it in question is believed to be responsible for all of the weird stuff that happened in Portlock. Ed goes on to explain what did happen to him at Dogfish Bay. In 1973, around the same time of the expedition by Dolitzal, Ed and two friends were hunting. After eating dinner, cleaning up, and retreating to their tents to sleep, Ed was woken by his friend Dennis around 2 a.m. Dennis shook him awake and then quietly explained that he had heard something pacing around the tent. Ed, of course, looked over at their other friend, Joe, who was already sat up, clutching a rifle to his chest. They sat in silence for a while, just listening, as whatever it was that was out there paced around on what seemed like two legs. And then, in the morning, when everybody felt safe enough to go out because the footsteps had stopped and it was brighter out, they discovered that whatever was walking around out there seemingly had left no tracks. Of course, this could just be a story told around the campfire when you're hunting with your buddies, or it could be a legitimate first-hand account of something odd happening to somebody. But of course, it's not the only story. There are a bunch of other ones, like the ones we've already mentioned, as well as that of Tom Larson. Tom, being interviewed in 1981 for what seems to have been some sort of high school assignment, tells a story about what happened to him. He was born in Stavanger, Norway in 1899 and came to Alaska in 1925. He bounced around Anchorage, Juneau, and a few other places for a little while before eventually just deciding to buy a sawmill and settling down in Portlock. His primary customers were, of course, the cannery, who needed his wood to construct fish traps, boats, and various other materials. And then, while chopping wood one day, he claims he saw a tall, mysterious, hairy figure on the beach, and that he ran inside, he grabbed his rifle, he came out with it loaded, and he and the thing just made eye contact. And he wasn't sure why, but for some reason he didn't pull the trigger. It seems like he was not the only one having these experiences, because of course, in 1949, according to Melania Kell, her family, as well as the other ones in Portlock, up and left for Nanwalek. The only person remaining in town was the postmaster, and by 1951, that post office was closed down as it was no longer servicing anybody. So of course, what was that giant hairy thing that scared them off? A lot of you are probably in the comments thinking, Bigfoot. A lot of you are probably in the comments thinking, this is a load of crap. Well, it's not Bigfoot per se, it's something called Nantunuk, but th that's about the main difference here. Because when describing Nantunuk, you're getting something more akin to a wild man, a, a half beast, something that is larger than humans, but also once lived amongst them, and depending on who you talk to, might have even at some point been human. So it doesn't quite fit with the mainstream Bigfoot lore. But I wanted to track down the beliefs about Nantunuk that weren't you know, just, just from the internet, from Reddit, or something like that. And I found an article by a Darren Smith, who's an Alaskan musician, writing for Anchorage Press. He himself is a Bigfoot believer and was interested in the story about Portlock and if anybody could tell him what happened, so he spoke to a local woman named Sally Ash in Nanwalek. Sally is the cousin of Melania Kell and was the translator for her story. Sally, of course, was not born in Portlock herself. She was born in nearby Dogfish Bay, but, as mentioned before, her cousin, Melania, was born in Portlock. She explains that her people were semi-nomadic, moving around as food sources dried up so that they could replenish and come back the next year. And one of the places that they would pass through to do some fishing and some resting was Portlock. By then, Portlock was abandoned, but the idea that it was empty wasn't totally there, because they were told not to go out on foggy days and to avoid being out alone and not to go into the woods because something was out there. According to her, her people feared this half-man, half-beast, Nantinuk. 
She herself believed Nantenuk to be half man, but it was different, it was disfigured, or perhaps half beast, and that it didn't want to live around people, so it just wandered off in the woods to be alone, where it became quite hairy and visually terrifying. According to her and her people, this creature lived in the woods around Portlock. In the interview, Sally speaks about Nantenuk as if it is both a an individual as well as a species or a tribe, but she goes into a little bit more detail when pressed that she herself believes this to be a singular creature. Like the Native American man from Ed's story, she says that she never saw the thing herself, but at one point her brother did. He said that the thing was tall, hairy, and walked with its knuckles forward, like, like that. Like, have you ever seen the Bigfoot videos where they're like, and most importantly, it smelled just awful. But Sally gives us another little tidbit of information, and this one's not about Portlock or Nantenuk, this is about Melania. Because according to her, Melania made her entire story up. Everything. All of the, the bodies in the water, the disappearances, the, the vague crime. According to her, Nantenuk is real, but it, it never hurt anybody. It was just minding its own business off in the woods. Kind of like those guys at Ruby Ridge back in the 90s. So it wasn't that they left Portlock because there was a monster hunting them. They left Portlock simply because it was not economical to be there anymore. There were more opportunities in Nanwellek, and there were more people and a better social safety net. It just was the, the correct thing to do for everybody's health and benefit to leave the town of Portlock. And in Darren's article, he kind of takes that. He's like, you know what? That makes sense, this whole thing was made up. But that's not enough for me. Now, Darren and I are in different camps here. He believes in Bigfoot, but he does not believe that Bigfoot is responsible for Portlock. I, on the other hand, don't believe in Bigfoot and do believe Bigfoot was responsible for Portlock. You might be saying, Aiden, that's a completely untenable and unreasonable position and it's contradictory. How could you ever have won debates in high school? I did. But what I mean by that is that while there is no photographic or physical evidence regarding the idea that a monster terrorized Portlock, there's a lot of evidence that something was bugging people and that this may not have been the simple practical decision to move that, that was suggested. Now, off the bat, why would Melania lie? Well, we've seen this in a couple of other stories we've looked at, where Native American elders from both the United States and Canada have been reluctant to tell their folk stories to white people, because we might laugh at them, we might not take them seriously, their, their monster stories and our monster stories aren't the same, so we wouldn't get it. There's a number of reasons why the natives wouldn't want to talk to white settlers about their specific stories. So it's not out of the question that Melania would make up the story. We've seen this before, of course, with J.W. Burns when he spoke to the Chehalis people about their stories about Sasquatch. Well, the elders didn't want to talk to him, so he had to go and talk to other people in the community who didn't have quite the same level of suspicion. But there's more than just Melania's story. Melania's story was published in 2009, but Dolitzal's story was published in 1973. And then of course there's Larson's, which was from 1981, and finally Ed's, which is from 2007. So all three of these other accounts that I found came about before Melania told her story. So even if she believed what she was saying wasn't true, she wasn't the first person to say it. And of course there's Simeon Kvasnikov who was interviewed for the same story as Melania. Going beyond the dating of accounts, there's the fact that the village was completely abandoned. And the people who abandoned it believed in this creature. So yes, 31 people is a small enough population to get together in the town meeting center one night and say, hey, do you guys all wanna leave by June 3rd? But still, it's weird that all 31 families left at once. And of course, we only have so many records, but basically all of the stories suggest the same thing. All 31 people living in that town, except for the postmaster, just up and left for Nanwalek. Is that how it would go if it were simply people leaving for economic reasons? You would think that it would have been one family and then maybe a couple and then maybe everybody else or just families trickling out over time. Instead, this story is told by the people who lived there routinely as everybody left at once. And finally, according to Alaska Magazine, that 1949 abandonment was not the first time that Port Lock was abandoned. They say that they have records from that cannery that was there in 1905 claiming that everybody was sent home for the season because of something in the forest. So beyond Melania, that is three different types of evidence that suggest there was something weird going on. And it's also hard to ignore the similarities between Nantanuk and the Saskets of the Chehalish people. Of course, they are located a considerable distance southeast of Portlock, down in British Columbia, but there are some striking similarities in these stories. Both describe these creatures as large hairy men who live in the forest, and that is what the words mean. 
is wild men or forest men or hairy men. Both of these seem to have the same degree of sentience or sapience where some of them can talk and they seem to behave in a less animalistic and more personal way where, for example, the one that just stared at Arson instead of, you know, attacking him immediately. And of course, in J.W. Burns' stories about the Sasquatch, what we're looking at is a creature that is capable of human speech. Both have an incredible capacity for violence when you trespass on their territory, and also they seem to only become aggressive when you threaten that territory. And then there's the degree of humanity presented, because Nantanook is presented as being half-human, partially human, human-adjacent, perhaps just another species of us. And that's exactly how the Saskets are described, except that it's not it's not as uniform, it's not as universal. Of course, we have more stories of them than we have of this creature, but they are sometimes capable of human speech. They are capable of violence. They are capable of tempering their attitude. But most importantly, they are partially human in both stories. That, you know, there is disagreement within the natives about whether these are other Native Americans, or if they are some other kind of creature entirely, in the Chehalish tradition at least. And then of course you talk to the, the people up who have the stories of the Nantanook, and it's the same kind of thing, where they can't really agree on is this human or not, how far from human is this, what are we dealing with, is this a wild person, is this a mixed breed of human and animal, like what are we dealing with here? And they're not the only people group in this area with a story of a half-human, half-beast or shape-shifting type creature. Down to the southeast, if you've seen our previous video on this subject, you'd be familiar with the Otter Man, the Kushtaka. And that that's a terrifying one because what it does is mimic a woman or a small child until it drags you into the lagoon because you've gone looking for the woman or small child where it rips you to shreds and devours parts your body. Considering one of the most famous stories about Portlock is that bodies were showing up in the water torn apart in ways that not only could a grizzly not do, but also wouldn't do. These were bodies that were torn apart with a, a particular degree of violence. This was not about eating something, this was about punishing something. So, of course, with there being multiple types of beasts and creatures from tribe to tribe, you've got to wonder if they are describing something that was in some way real to them. So are we looking at old stories of another species of human that has survived somehow and lives off in the woods in small enough numbers that we don't necessarily recognize them as being something other than us? Or could these be stories about old hostile tribes that no longer exist or moved out of the area and as they were passed down became stories about monsters because they just couldn't possibly, men couldn't do that to one another? There's a lot of questions with Portlock and part of the reason is that there's so little documentation and such interesting stories. Of course, the TV show Alaskan Killer Bigfoot tried to talk about it, but I, I mean, if you trust a show called Alaskan Killer Bigfoot, I've got a bridge to sell you. Like I said, the question remains, is this something human? Something part human lurking off in the forests? Or are these just stories made up by the local natives to scare the out-of-towners? Of course, as always, we are very interested in what your thoughts are, so let us know in the comments what you think of the Portlock, Alaska situation. If you want to support what we do here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for just $1 a month. You can also become a member here on YouTube. You can also catch us talking about these things live Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time every week, or catch the audio versions of those the following Tuesday on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you also want to support us while drinking something delicious, you can get the Lore Lodge Coffee Mount Pocono Perk from Tableau Roasting Company. Not sure what else to say about it, it's delicious. And like us, you might have forgotten that we have merch. It's at thelorelodge.shop. Go check it out, and you can pity the gourd. And speaking of pitying the gourd, we also have two other channels, The Weird Bible and History Hut. They don't have a ton of content right now, but they're getting it. And if you'd like to interact with other fans of the show, followers, or just simply have a better access to our announcements, you can join our Discord at bit.ly slash jointhelodge. With all of that said, I am Aiden Mattis, and thank you for stopping by the world.